Hello to everyone at The Mission. We're premiering our video at 1 o'clock, so good afternoon. Next week, we hope to premiere our video at 10 a.m. It was a bit of a scramble to put together a recording schedule, but uh, we've got one together, but we just weren't able to get it out at 10 a.m. So it's 1 o'clock now, and like I said, next week it should be at 10 a.m. First of all, I want to thank everyone who has taken the time to send an email, write a text message, or phone call in to let us know and show support for the decision to to spend the next two weeks online. We want to thank everyone who recognizes the need for us to take some time and learn about the pandemic as it affects our own church community and our local community so that we can prepare ourselves to have a successful Advent season. Even though these are trying times, we want everyone to think of others. And so we just want our thoughts and prayers go out to all those families that are affected by uh, the pandemic. And as a reminder, if uh, you are at home isolating and can't be at work, uh, and that presents to you food issues as well as financial issues, let us know how we can help you. The mission is happy to come alongside and affect you in any way that we can. Even though these are trying times, we'd like to move forward with the ministries that God has called us to. And I have a couple announcements as we get started this morning. First of all, the work day has been moved from uh, move forward or postponed, I should say, to Saturday, November 20, when uh, we'll be able to just gather again and uh, rake the leaves. There'll probably be a few more on the ground than there are now. And uh, starting at 9 a.m., bring your own tools and it'll just be a great morning just cleaning up this place and getting it ready for the winter and the spring as well. This is the time of Christmas conspiracy. Christmas conspiracy is a time where we conspire to reclaim Christmas as a time of giving in the name of Jesus. Starting last week and over the next five or six weeks, we're going to be highlighting some charities that you can give to and support them in the work that they do to make this world a better place. Last week and this week, we promote uh, Samaritan's Purse Christmas Shoebox uh, Drive. Last week, the shoeboxes went out and they were collected, and I'm sure they're being passed around and being filled up. If you have one or want one, we can drive one out to you. Uh, you can come and pick one up in the office just let us know but we need to have those christmas shoe boxes in by next um, sunday november 14th and that poses an interesting logistical problem because next sunday we will only be offering an online service so melanie and i were talking about this and we want to encourage you to go out and fill a christmas shoe box we really do so with that in mind uh, we were just you know, just brainstorming some ideas. And we would like to offer a unique drop-off experience. We know that part of the fun of Christmas shoe boxes is going out, filling them, and then bringing them together for everyone to see how many are collected. Next week, Melanie and I will come to the building and we'll offer a drop-off time of uh, Saturday from 6 to 8 p.m. And we'll make it a unique drop-off experience where maybe the McNamara family will have its uh, Christmas PJs on. We can give you some hot chocolate or something like that. But we want to encourage you to get out and still fill those Christmas shoe boxes. Like I said, it might be difficult times, but we'd like to encourage everyone to still consider giving and still consider thinking of others. So that's next Saturday from 6 until 8 p.m. Drive to the building, drop it off for a unique uh, drop-off experience. We'll send some email, we'll send out an email or two with some more details uh, in the coming week. I think those are the announcements that I want uh, to highlight. As you can see, I'm wearing a collar shirt because uh, earlier today I had a suit on as uh, there was a crowd of people here to just celebrate uh, the life of Penny Hom. I want to thank uh, all of the people who came to usher and volunteer and create a successful uh, celebration of life here in our building. But it was just a tremendous time of reflecting on what God did in her life, thanking God for the years that he gave her to us and celebrating what Christ did in her life and the ministry she had uh, with the mission. Thinking about her work as a deacon as well as all the years that she spent as our worship uh, director. She was a fitting tribute here in the building and also a fitting tribute at Langton Cemetery. They parked uh, two transport trucks out front and it was just a, a great tribute to the, her role here in our church family and in the local community as well. 
Thanks to video technology and being online, we are still going to continue our sermon series. If you're joining us online, this will now be week two of a four-week sermon series called Tethered to Travel Through 22. Four sermons over four weeks and four different speakers who are giving us messages to prepare us for the year to come. This week, our speaker is Rob, and he's going to bring a message on... Um, well, I th I, 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 he's giving us a message as entitled uh, a spiritual checkup as we think about the year to come. Where are we at in our relationship with Christ? And do we need a bit of a checkup to make sure that we're healthy enough to travel through 22? So I just encourage you to have an open heart and open mind to what Rob has to bring us today as we challenge ourselves and prepare ourselves for the year to come. I'm just going to uh, wrap up this time of announcements with our congregational prayer and uh, just lift up the prayers and the needs of our church family. There will be a video after this highlighting the or reminding us of the work that Samaritan's Purse and Christmas Shoeboxes do. We'll have a song, Rob's message, and then Lynn and the team will close us off with another song. I just want to remind everyone about, uh, you know, the needs of the, our church congregation and uh, what's going on. Uh, we're just thinking of uh, Noah Bear and uh, we're thinking of Abe, both with uh, broken bones uh, from falls. And we just want to continue to pray for their quick healing. And of course, we want to pray for the families that are impacted by the pandemic. We want to pray for Pete and the family as uh, they mourn and grieve there, the passing of Penny and um, just the work that is the journey that uh, they're on and we're all on as we've said goodbye to a dear friend of ours. So let's just take these next few moments. Let's open up in prayer, prepare ourselves for Rob's message and what's happening in our congregation. Father God, we do come before you to just thank you so much for the life of Penny. We thank you so much for giving her to us for all those years. We thank you for the wonder mem memories that were created. We thank you, Father, for the character that you developed in her. Pelly, many people shared of just about how much they loved meeting Penny, her kindness, her sweetness, her gentleness, and her Christ-like character. We thank you, Father, for the musical talent that you gave her, the ability that she had to lead us in worship, and Father, how she also brought that care to the deaconship, and how she cared for people, even through this pandemic, right up until her body could no longer do it. Father, we pray for Pete. We pray that uh, you would bless him in this time. Let him sense the presence of his shepherd, and uh, that he might know uh, that you are with him, and you walk through this time. Uh, we thank you for his attitude. We thank you for his faith. Father, we think of all the people who came and heard a gospel message that it would uh, bear fruit. We think of all the people who came and uh, just paid tribute uh, to Penny. Father, our community is uh, going through a tough time with the pandemic right now. Father, we pray that uh, you'd highlight to us all the needs that need to be met. Pray, Father, that uh, you'd keep us safe. And, Father, that uh, for those in our community dealing with COVID-19, that their symptoms would be mild and they would be delivered um, from their conditions. We pray, Father, for your continual guidance. We pray, pray, Father, for wisdom as we seek to be a community and exist together, but to think about the times that we face, to think about selflessness, to think about care. And Father, to just think about those who are impacted in it. Think about to be selfless and uh, to just, Father, come alongside each other uh, during this time. Father, as we think about those in need, we also lift to you some of those in our congregation with uh, injuries. We know that there are others out there. And uh, we pray, Father, that uh, you'd continue to work your healing touch for people like uh, Noah and Abe and maybe those we're not even aware of those who right now are uh, just uh, at home because of whatever reason and maybe unable to work. Father, I pray you'd give them faith to know that uh, you will provide still for them. Father, today Rob brings us a message about uh, thinking about our spiritual health. Pray, Father, that we'd have an open heart and an open mind to receive what he has for us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal to us the true nature of where our spiritual health is at. Show us, Father, where we need to grow. Show us, Father, 
where we're really at and help us to be prepared for the year to come. Father, as we think about um, this time of Advent that's on our doorstep and the Christmas conspiracy, move us beyond ourselves, create in us a spirit of selflessness. Father, may we get out and fill a shoebox for someone else. Next week, we'll highlight another one, and may we give to another charity to help them continue making this world a better place and enacting on your will and your heart for every person that needs help. Thank you, Father, for this time this morning. Thank you that you provided the resources to be able to pro still provide a video in a tight spot that we can all still remember that we follow you each day. We give you our obedience each day, and we're so thankful for your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. The joy of seeing a child open the boxes for the first time is just, it's incredible. There's squeals and screams, and they're so excited to see what's inside their box. Oh, my goodness! Every shoebox gift represents the love of God to them. We are so excited. Many of the children receive the shoebox for the first time in their life. We're here with Operation Christmas Child. The kids are so excited. We had the opportunity to hand out some of the boxes. It was so much joy, so much happiness, and it gives us an opportunity to present the gospel. We pray that these boxes will be used to bring a lot of happiness and joy, but more importantly, the gospel to each heart, to all these little children around the world. What a great gift. I get a present, I get to know who Jesus is, but not only that, I get to be discipled in his ways. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers work with Operation Christmas Child every year, preparing these boxes, praying for the boxes, that God will use them in a mighty way for His glory. This little shoe box has the opportunity to change the world. Not only are they going to get a shoe box, they're going to get the love and the message of Jesus Christ. Some go by helicopter, some go by ship, some go by camel, donkeys, canoes. We go at great lengths to take these boxes to children in the most remote parts of the world. And it's an incredible journey. After these children open the box, they have the opportunity to go through the greatest journey, the 12 lesson discipleship program, where they get to learn more about Jesus Christ. Right now, I'm right outside of Mazlan, Mexico, about six hour drive up in the mountains. This is an indigenous people group, people that never heard the gospel before. The kids and the families that accepted Christ, almost a hundred all together, have now started a church. This shoe box gives us an opportunity to continue to shine the bright light of the gospel in the darkest and remote places around the world. We're seeing families come to know Jesus. Churches are sprouting up in these communities. These children are rising up to be disciples in their own country. The gift box and the gospel of Jesus Christ bring hope to our children to bring the smiles back on their faces. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out and bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you. And God bless each and every one. family, please join us in singing Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord.
Well, let's begin with a, a quick prayer, shall we? Uh, Father, I am so thankful that you have allowed me to deliver this really important message, and I am thankful that uh, you've been changing my life as I've been even preparing for this message. Lord, I pray that um, you will guide my thoughts and my words this morning, that I'll speak only the things that come from your heart. Uh, you and I both know that apart from you, I can do nothing. And Lord, I pray for people wherever and whenever they're, uh, they're watching this message that uh, your Holy Spirit would be very real with them, uh, making your, the words uh, come alive in their heart and that you will uh, you begin to the work in, in the lives of many as a result of this this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to not get to my... Uh, main text for quite a while here this morning. So what I'm going to do is give you a verse that gives you a little bit of a peek into uh, where I'm going with this message. The verses are in uh, Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. It says, And now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down, uh, grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. You know, back in about 1982, <clears throat> Louise and I moved to Edmonton with our little family of three boys. Uh, this turned out to be a really good time for us uh, living in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, I had a good job with uh, the Alberta government. Uh, Louise was uh, at home taking care of our home and our boys, but also doing some home daycare at our in our residence there, we had a nice little new home on a nice street. Uh, we attended a, a great church uh, with loving people, made some good friends there. Uh, I was uh, involved as uh, on the board. I was uh, leading worship. I was teaching uh, college and careers class. Uh, Louise, as always, was totally immersed in the children's program at the church there because she has a real gift for that. 
And uh, to top it all off, the Edmonton Oilers were uh, are unquestionably the, the uh, best hockey team in the world at the time. And things were going really great. And, but I went through a period of time where for some reason I was coming home after church every Sunday morning and I was just feeling guilty or feeling inadequate. Uh, I'd, I, one Sunday I'd come home and I felt like I wasn't praying enough and then I wasn't reading my Bible enough and I wasn't witnessing enough and I wasn't serving enough and, and I went through this period of time where I just felt really discouraged about the state of my Christianity. I felt like somehow if I could just do better I would be a better Christian. Well the fact is I was giving myself a mistaken view of what spiritual health for a Christian really is all about. So the question here as we begin this morning is how do you go about judging your health as a Christian? Well, there are three things that I think Christians commonly use as a means of ga gauging their spiritual health. And these are, don't get me wrong, these are very important things for every Christian. But the question for, that I want to present to you is are they really the measure of our spiritual health? Well, the first one would be praying regularly. Uh, pray, of course, is essential to our spiritual health. It's what keeps us in touch with God. But it might be useful to consider not just how regularly we pray or how much time we spend praying, but what do our prayers generally look like? You know, I think if it was, some, if it was possible to somehow track, the, many of us would find that our praying is overwhelmingly about asking God for something. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking God for things. Uh, God, the, the Word of God tells us to do that. God encourages us to come to Him with our requests. So there's nothing wrong with that, and it doesn't usually mean that we're being selfish. I mean, we might be asking about legitimate needs uh, on behalf of ourselves, but very often we're praying for someone else who has a need. Uh, we are uh, praying for our church or for our country. And uh, the Bible even encourages us even to pray for our enemies. So the idea of, of asking for things in prayer is, is a good thing. But is our prayer life entirely about asking? Like how would you feel if your son or your daughter only spoke to you when they wanted something from you? So could it be that our relationship with God is mostly about what we can get from Him? Uh, there's a danger we can ask, is, uh, ask, act as if God exists to do things for us, like, uh, like, a, like a Santa Claus. <clears throat> God encourages us to bring our needs to Him, and I, I don't want you to stop doing it. But prayer is far more than asking for things. It's about communing with God. It's about spending time in His presence. Uh, here's a question that we need to ask ourselves is simply this. Do I spend most of my time in prayer asking for things and then judge my spiritual health by the amount of time I spend praying? I'll leave that with you for a second to, uh, to consider. Well, here's a second way that we often judge our spiritual health, and that is this, living a Christian lifestyle. Now, most of us understand by now that Christianity is a lot more than following a list of do's and don'ts. That's, that's sort of an old style of thinking, and that's not where we're at. But there are certainly things that God wants us, expects us, even commands us to do. Uh, some of those things have to do with how we behave. Uh, there are definitely standards the Bible lays out for us as to what our life is supposed to look like. And it tells us about some sinful behaviors that we're supposed to avoid. Uh, there are also some expectations for how we're supposed to treat other people. Jesus and the apostles teach us to adopt a certain lifestyle in terms of our priorities, our actions, uh, and our relationships with other people. They are important to ourselves and to our Christian example to others. So these following God's rules, so to speak, is an important thing for us to do. But can we measure our spiritual health by how, how well we follow the rules of a Christian life? Can we say, I'm living the way a Christian should, I'm uh, caring and compassionate toward other people, I'm giving of myself and my resources, and therefore I'm spiritually healthy? Well, these are all good things that Jesus told us should be priorities for all of us. 
but is my spiritual health wrapped up in acting like a good little Christian? Well, here's the third thing that sometimes we use as a measure of our spiritual health, and it's a very common misconception, perhaps more common even than the other two, and that is that the quality of my spiritual life is tied to my level of Christian service. In other words, if I do more for God, I'll be a better Christian. You know, there was a point in my life when I absolutely knew beyond any doubt that God was telling me to leave my secular career and go into Christian ministry. I knew that, and I was more than prepared to do it, but what if instead God told me to keep working in my secular career and be a, a Christian witness to my fellow workers? Would that make me a lesser Christian or any less spiritual? See, putting in a lot of hours or even making sacrifices doesn't in itself make us spiritually healthy. Perhaps you might have sometime come across a pastor or a Christian worker who pours themselves into their ministry so much that their family suffers or, uh, and, or they get burned out. So is a person more spiritually healthy because they sacrifice their family and their physical health? Once again, please don't misunderstand me. Uh, this whole message, or this part of the message, uh, there's, a, ten, there's a, a danger that people are going to misconstrue what I'm trying to say. Don't misunderstand me. Applying ourselves to Christian service is a very good thing. And being willing to serve God however He calls us to is very important. God needs people who are willing to serve, and He sometimes even asks us to make personal sacrifices. But, can I judge my spiritual health by how much I'm doing for God. So, it's essential to pray. It's important to live a God-honoring lifestyle. It's a good thing to serve God out of a desire to please Him. But as important as all of these things are, none of them individually, or even all together, represent spiritual health. In fact, I believe it's possible that I could do all of those things and not even truly be a Christian. So, if it's not that, what is it? Well, here's my main point to you this morning. Our spiritual health does not come from what we do for Jesus. It comes from our relationship with Jesus. Now, when I say relationship, I'm not talking about that day when you first placed your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. You know, in preparation for this message, I did some Google searching, um, and I searched on these phrases, relationship with God or relationship with Jesus. Now, almost everything that I came up with had something to do with, with accepting Jesus, becoming a Christian. And it would seem like our moment of conversion has often come to be widely described as having a relationship with Jesus. And I know that I've used that term myself in connection with that. Well, that moment is hugely important. It's a, it's a time when our sins are forgiven, uh, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, and we become part of God's family. So it's a huge moment, and it is certainly a relationship with Jesus, but it's only the beginning of God wants for us in that relationship. He wants that relationship to grow and to develop. That's when we're spiritually healthy. If I were to adopt a child, it's the start of an amazing brand new relationship. But there's still a lot of growing to do. Some of you have been through that process, and you know this better than I. You know that on that wonderful day when you welcomed that child into your family, it was just the beginning of something that was really important. You still had a lot to do to, to learn to understand one another, to, to learn to trust one another, and to love one another in a far greater way than was possible on that first day. This is a growing process. So what if you adopted that child and the next day they went off across the country to a boarding school so that you hardly ever saw each other and you maybe talked via FaceTime or something once in a while? As much as you might try and both of you to make the best of it, 
of that relationship, the, the relationship isn't going to grow and develop the same as it would if you live together, if you share life together, and truly get to know one another. Knowing and trusting and sharing are the key to the development of a relationship. These are also the keys to developing a growing relationship with Jesus. So now, after what is rather a long introduction, we finally come to the point of the message. Is knowing Jesus the driving force of my Christian life? There's a chorus that we sing in our churches. We used to sing it perhaps more frequently. Uh, it, it goes like this, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Uh, it's really based on a verse in, uh, in Psalm, chapter 42, verse 1. And I'm, my scripture this morning is all coming from the New Living Translation, so it might sound a little differently. But this is the way that that verse reads in the NLT. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O Lord. Can you hear the cry from the heart of the psalmist here? He's not longing to know more about God. And he's not praying that he's going to, uh, to serve God better. He's longing for God himself, for a deeper relationship. Prayer and lifestyle and service are great and important. But the reason they're great and important is not because they're about earning points with God or doing our duty. They, these things need to happen in the context of our desire to know Jesus. That's when they contribute to our spiritual health. We do those things out of a desire to grow in our relationship with him. Now, we've been talking during this four-week period here about preparing ourselves for the year ahead. And one important thing that we can do is to take our spiritual temperature. How are we doing? What, what is the state of my spiritual health? It's not an assessment of whether we have arrived at some kind of a perfect relationship with Jesus, because the fact is that's not going to happen in this world. It's more of an assessment of whether we have that heart's desire. Like the psalmist, do we long for him? What if we prayed and lived a faithful Christian life and willingly served God because we have a deep desire to know Jesus better, to have that deeper relationship with him? I want to uh, read this, this morning from Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> We're going to start at verse 5. And I encourage you to follow along with me. So if you need to stop this recording and look that up in your Bible or on your uh, app or whatever, I encourage you to follow along here in Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 5. Paul says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Now, I'm going to pause here for a moment. We're going to continue to read in a moment, but I'll just pause here to say this. Up to this point, Paul is talking about the amazing transformation that happened in his life and his priorities when he came to faith in Christ. He says he traded his self-righteousness for the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus. 
So that's really the, the point of these first verses that we just read. But then we come to verse 10. And in verse 10, his perspective changes, and now he's not looking backward, he's looking forward. And this is what he says in verse 10 and 11. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Now, let me just point out here that it's been 25 to 30 years or so since Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And during that 25 or 30 years, he has become God's leading missionary to the Gentiles. He's traveled throughout the Mediterranean world, spreading the gospel, founding churches, and developing Christian leaders who will take up the responsibilities as he leaves. He has written letters that form a huge part of our New Testament. He's one of the greatest Christian leaders of all time, perhaps the greatest. If there's anyone who could be satisfied because of his life and his accomplishments for Jesus, that would be Paul. As he looks back, if, if he were to reflect on all the things that he's accomplished in this 25 or 30 years of serving Jesus, it's an amazing list of accomplishments. And he should be able to look at that and say, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way that things are going. Yet he says there, he says, what I want is a deeper relationship with Jesus. I want to know him more. Verse 10, I want to know Christ. I want to know him more. Now, we'll continue on from verse 12 where he says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. I don't know Jesus perfectly, he says. But I press on uh, to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Now this passage, if you just take some of these verses out of context, it's sometimes read as, I am pressing on to do more for Jesus. But when we look at the whole passage and the whole context, it's clear that that's not really what it's all about. Paul is saying, I haven't reached that perfect knowledge of Jesus, that perfect relationship, that depth of relationship that I want. I haven't reached that yet. But as long as I have breath, that's my goal. He says, in spite of all the things that God has allowed me to do in his service, in spite of all the things that I've been able to accomplish, I have not yet reached the point that I want to reach in my knowledge and relationship with Jesus Christ. He arguably, arguably accomplished more in his service to Jesus than anyone in history, but said, I'm not satisfied with all of that. He doesn't say, I want to know more about Christ. That's something altogether different. He says, I want to know him more. It's like the psalmist who said he longed for God. Paul is saying, I long for more of Jesus. And this is what may be the most important question of all when it comes to our spiritual health. Do we want more of Jesus, or do we just want more of what he has to offer us? I mean, we've got our ticket to heaven. It's uh, safely tucked away in our pocket. Uh, we're doing our best to live a good Christian life. We're serving God to the best of our ability with our talents, and that's all great stuff. Don't stop. Keep it up. But now the question, do we long to know him like Paul did or like the psalmist wrote in Psalm 42? I believe that that desire or lack of it is a measure of our spiritual health. It's not a question of whether or not we have arrived. I can say pretty confidently that, that none of us have. The question is whether there is a longing in our hearts that has not yet been satisfied. A loss of appetite physically often means that we're not healthy physically. Well, a loss of spiritual appetite means that we need to take a look at our own spiritual health. So if it... If, it w if, if so, it will change our prayer life from asking into communion with God. If so, it'll change our living and serving God in a way that's going to take on new meaning. 
Now, you can't go to a doctor and you can't even go to the pastor to check on your spiritual health. This is a checkup that you have to do for yourself. Only you can tell. Only you know if you've got a longing in your heart to know Jesus better and better. Only you know if your passion is to go deeper in your relationship with him. You know, we periodically in our churches partake in a sacrament that we call the Lord's Supper. It's interesting that this has commonly come to be known as a communion service. Well, think about what the word communion means. Think about what the word communion means really means. It makes me think of a passage in Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation 3, Jesus is dictating a letter to the church in Laodicea. The Christians in Laodicea have become lukewarm in their spiritual life, and that's of a real concern to Jesus. They've gotten to the point where they're really just going through the motions as Christians. They've lost their passion to know Jesus. And what does Jesus say to this group of half-hearted believers? Well, in verse 20, he says this. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. Jesus says there's a, there's a, a solution to this problem that you've got, where you're half-hearted, where you're lukewarm, where you've lost your passion. He said, let me come in and we will commune together. We'll be friends. Jesus says he wants to have communion with us. He wants us to spend time with him. He wants us to get to know him better. So the question for all of us this morning, is that what we want? Do I have a desire in my heart to, like Paul said, to know Jesus better? Or as he said to the Colossians in the verse that we read at the beginning of this message, do we want to go deeper in our relationship with him? That's a question that each one of us has to ask for ourselves, And I believe it's the measure of our spiritual health. Not that I've arrived, but do I have that desire in my heart to know Jesus better? Is it the thing that drives me? Is it the thing that drives me in my, spirit, in my prayer life so that my prayer life is more than just a time of asking, but it's a time of communion? Does it drive me in my Bible reading so I'm not just reading to know about Jesus, but I read with a desire to know him? You can allow and rely on the Holy Spirit to help to lead you into a deeper relationship with Jesus if it's what you really want. And so I want to challenge you with that this morning. Is it what you want? As you look at your spiritual health, I think that's a pretty good indicator for you to look at. Am I spiritually healthy? Do I have a desire to know Jesus better? Do I want a deeper relationship with him? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you started this process. That, that the message that goes throughout the whole Bible is about your desire to be in relationship with us and to bring us back into a place where, like you, like, like you had with Adam in the garden, where you could walk and talk together. Lord, I just pray that we would have that desire in our hearts to have that relationship with you. Father, I pray that as, we, as that desire is cultivated in our lives, that it will transform the way that we read our Bibles, the way that we pray, pray the way that we serve you, that it'll be about uh, not just doing our duty or going through the motions, but that it will have a purpose, and our purpose is to know you better, to go in our deeper in our relationship with you. Lord, I ask your blessing on all who are listening to this message today, and I ask that these words from your word that we've read, the scripture that we've read this morning will find a place deep in our hearts and it'll begin to transform us in our motivation and give us a greater passion to know you better. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we were just at Penny's funeral, and if any song, if there was any song that would maybe talk about her and her testimony, it would even it would be this one. And we didn't even choose this song because of that. But it's it's called "Called Me Higher." You have made me deeper. You have uh, called me higher, and she did this in her life and and her the funeral was just a testimony of that i pray that we can make this a, our testimony as well
Father God, may this be the prayer of our heart, first to open our eyes to what you are telling us, what you are calling us to. Lord, may we be tender to that calling, and may we be obedient, obedient because you have called us higher. You have called us deeper. None of this uh, just warm stuff, Lord. Help us to check our spiritual temperature. Lord, may we be so sensitive to your calling. And may we just do that in obedience and take that step as you have called us higher. In your precious holy name I pray. Amen.